بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين أما بعد uh, We begin today inshallah في سورة الأنعام uh, verse number 19 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says قُلْ أَيُّ شَيْءٍ أَكْبَرُ شَهَادَةً Ask, say, what testimony uh, is the what is the greatest of testimonies? Um, so here, Allah subhanahu wa taala is engaging the validity of the prophet's claim, والسلام, that he is the prophet of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And throughout this chapter, um, this is really one of the major themes. What are the evidences that that the prophet والسلام, is truly a prophet of Allah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives various evidences and various ways to engage that. We spoke a little bit about the concept of miracles. Today we're, we're adding a different type of engagement. And the question is, what is the greatest type of testimony? Now, there is a response, a direct response afterwards. Say, Qulillah, say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, in the world of debate and discussion, I cannot assume I cannot inf uh, I cannot impose upon you a particular position so for example I think that um, let me what is I think that um, let's see here eating spinach is good right I think that and we're having a discussion about a a cuisine, a dish that is spinach based. And let's say you disagree. You say, no, spinach isn't actually good for you. Or, or that cuisine isn't good. Now, if I were to come and say, no, you have to accept that spinach is good for you. I don't have the right to impose that upon you. Unless it is 100% clear cut. Meaning every single re medical research or nutrition research around nutrition, around spinach, etc. Claims unequivocally all the experts to all of time say that spinach is good for you, no doubt. Now here I can, imp I can impose this upon you. Why? Because it's not my opinion anymore. It is clear-cut evidence. But besides that, I can't do it. And so when Allah is saying, Qulillah, say Allah is the greatest of testifiers. I can from the debate world, I cannot impose that upon the questioner, upon the other person, unless it is um, something that is accepted by both sides. And so the fact that Allah is doing that here indicates what? That Quraysh accept this premise. That they accept that Allah is truly the best and the greatest of testifiers and witnesses. Okay? Um, and so... We know that, and we've gone over before that, Quraysh believed in Allah. They believed in His um, grandness. They believed that He is the supreme, etc. To the extent that they wouldn't dare take an oath using Allah's name as a lie or in vain. They wouldn't dare out of fear of punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They wouldn't play around with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name. So when Allah is saying that Allah is the greatest of testifiers, now we're on common grounds with Quraysh. And so you want evidence that I am a prophet? Well, part of evidence or a type of evidence are witnesses. Especially in uh, older times when you didn't have these sophisticated uh, forms of evidences and, and uh, seeking evidences like detective and all these tools and gadgets that they use. Uh, back in the day, a lot of court cases were settled based on testimonies. I mean, we have nothing besides that. And back in the day when people were, generally speaking, more honest, it served a greater role, right? Um, and so, the pro what Allah is saying here is telling the Prophet ﷺ, look, tell them Allah is a witness that what I am saying is true. Allah witnesses that I am a prophet. Allah is a witness between me and you, between us. And so Quraysh knows we, we're not a people who use Allah's name randomly, in vain. We don't do this thing. And you already accept that, O Quraysh. So look at what I'm saying. You know Allah observes all that's going on. He knows all that is going on. And He intervenes in all that happens. And that's why you refrain from using His name in vain. Here I am making this claim in front of you 
and in front of Allah. Allah testifies that I am his messenger and thus according to their mentality. If the Prophet والسلام, is wrong, he is lying, then the assumption that Allah is going to punish him and expose his lie. Yet that never happened. So what does that mean? He is telling the truth. And so Allah says, وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلْ عَنَيْنَا بَعْضَ الْأَقَاوِيلِ If this individual, the Prophet والسلام, were to fabricate certain things about us, meaning him subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُ بِالْيَمِينَ we would take him with our right, meaning with force and power. We would take him. And we would cut him off from his essential vital veins that connect him to his that connect his blood to his heart. Meaning we would punish him, disgrace him, we would end him. Right? And none of you can help him in this regard. None of you can save him if he was fabricating something against us. So here we are. The Prophet is speaking and saying this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only didn't punish him in any way, not only did he not, he did not expose his lies or anything like that. On the contrary, the Prophet ﷺ kept making way and progress after progress after progress after progress, victory after victory after victory. What does that tell you? If there is a God who actually witnesses all that is going on, then this man must have been telling the truth. Or else why would Allah sit back and allow someone to lie about him and just not do anything about it? And so, for example, someone is speaking bad of you, saying, you know this, this lady in here? Yeah, she's doing this, this, and that. She's actually stealing from people. She went into so-and-so's house and took her jewelry and whatnot. Word comes to you. Whoa, whoa, what is this person saying? It's all lies. What are you going to do? What would you do? Confront the person. Well, what are you doing? These are all lies. You don't accept, no one accepts someone speaking wrong about him or her. They're going to do something about it. If they don't do something about it, it means one of two things. Either they don't know, and thus they lack knowledge, or they don't have the ability to do it, right? Or it's true. One of the three. They don't have the ability to defend themselves. Now, does Allah not know what's going on? Hasha yeah. lillah, He knows. Does Allah not have the ability to interject and stop the Prophet ﷺ if he was lying? Of course he does. He has the power. Then what's left? It is true. That is the fact of the matter. And Ibn Qayyim Rahmatullah says that he was in a, a debate with a Christian, with a priest. And they were debating whether or not the Prophet ﷺ was a messenger of Allah. And Ibn Qayyim says that, if what you are saying is true, that this man is a false prophet, he was a liar, then in reality, the logical conclusion to that fact is that God doesn't exist. And the priest was like, well, how did you come to that conclusion? He said, this man claimed to be a messenger of God and gained victory after victory after victory until our day today. That was when? 700 Hijri, 700 years ago. And in our times today, Islam keeps making progress after progress despite being in political misery, political weakness. Islam continues to grow. Islam continues to get stronger despite the immense and intense pressure on Muslims and Islam. Despite all, despite, despite all of the lies and the propaganda and the missions against Islam and all of the stuff that's being used, all of the resources, Islam continues to grow. The numbers of Muslims didn't decrease, it's increasing by birth and by conversion, right? So do you think this man has made this claim against Allah and is an enemy of Allah, yet he and his religion and his followers continue to grow and grow and grow until this day and Allah is not doing anything about it. That means there is no God. There is no God. Or else why would he sit back and let this false prophet completely, uh, completely talk ill of the true religion? If you claim Christianity is the true religion. Continue to defeat the supposed followers of Jesus. Militarily back then and in today, debate. 
You see it when Muslims debate Christians on the, the concept of the Trinity, or the concept of uh, the divinity of Jesus, or any of these things. They're always defeated. Do you think this messenger is, is, is false and all these people go back to a, a liar and God is sitting there doing absolutely nothing, giving them the victory after victory after victory? What is that nonsense? That means God doesn't exist. And so the only logical conclusion is that if God exists, then this man must be a messenger of Allah, assisted by Allah. Because as even historians and analysts have said, no man has accomplished as much as this man did in such a short period of time. 23 years, he changed the globe. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Where else do you see that in history? And so if there is someone who Allah has assisted in human history, it is this man. Because what he did in of itself is a miracle. Alayhi salatu wasalam. وَأُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لِأُنذِرَكُمْ بِهِ وَمَنْ بَلَغْ And this Qur'an has been revealed to me so that I warn you and warn those who this Qur'an reaches. Um, and so here, this is backing up uh, the Prophet ﷺ in one of two ways, or in both actually. Number one, the Qur'an in of itself is a miracle. If the testimony that I have just made is not enough for you, this argument is not enough for you, well, Allah is backing it up with this miracle of the Qur'an. This Qur'an is the miracle you seek, you ask. And if you deny this, then you'll deny all other miracles. Right? If this isn't miraculous enough for you, then the moon splitting or uh, turning the Safa and Marwa into gold, it's not going to do any difference. If, it was, if the difference, if, if what you needed to accept Islam, accept a religion, is a miracle, well, here it is. So Allah is assisting me. And you know, O Quraysh, that this isn't my words. You know I am illiterate. You know I am unlearned. You know I don't go and sit with these other people as they fabricate against him. As we'll get to in just a second. Right. So this is my Quran. Here's my assistance. Um, no. that, so that's one way. The other way is that... Oh, I'll slip my mind. Um that this Qur'an is testifying to what I say and is speaking to you all not in a sense where the Prophet is the author but rather the author is the creator of the heavens and the earth I don't claim to create the heavens and the earth I didn't do that I don't claim that what is going on here is in my control all of that, the, what is being said in the Qur'an is being said not in the perception or the point of view of the Prophet but rather in the point of view of the one who created the heavens and the earth. Um, do you testify that there are deities with Allah or besides Allah? Say, I don't testify to that. I, dis I disbelieve in that. So here just simply clarifying his position. What he is calling to, that is Tawheed. Say he is one Lord, uh, He is one God, and indeed I am innocent, I am free of what you associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ Those who we have given the book to, meaning the Jews and the Christians, they know Him, they recognize Him the way they recognize their children. Now, this chapter as we know is a, is a Meccan chapter. All of it is Mecki. And what that means is that this is before the Qur'an begins to engage the Jews and the Christians and before there was direct engagement between the Muslims and the people of the book. And so the question is, well, what does this have to do with, why is this in this chapter? It seems out of place, out of context. And the answer to that is, perhaps, uh, in fact, we know that Quraysh would go to the Jews and inquire about what the Prophet ﷺ is doing. What should we ask him? How do we know? What do you think about it? So they went to the Prophet, uh, they went to the Jews uh, uh, to see what their opinion was of what the Prophet is saying and, his, and he is doing. So Allah responds and says, see the people you went to, right? Their disregard, their disbelief in the Prophet right, is lying, is, is a form of lying. They are lying to you because they know him the way they know the children. So the question is, how do they know him? Right? Um, one way is that, as Allah says, that they, they know the Prophet through their books. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken of the last and final messenger in the Torah and the Injil, and he has described the Prophet in both of them. And so they know him, they see, oh, there's overlap here, there's a connection, they're exactly the same. What we see in our book about the last messenger and what we are seeing of this man and what he is claiming, what he is doing, is exactly the same. Why were the Jews there in the first place? Why were the Jews in Arabia in the first place? What brought them there? Why were they just sitting in, why didn't they go to, you know, where the, the Jews were during that time? They were waiting for the last and final messenger. Literally in the cities, in the areas of the Arabian Gulf that matched the description where the Prophet would come from or will, would be. A city of a lot of palm trees. So they lived in Medina and Khaybar and Fadak. These three areas are lush and full of palm trees. Mecca, when you go to Mecca, doesn't have any palm trees. But when you enter Medina, full of palm trees. So they had the, the dates of, of Medina, etc. So they were there waiting for him. Also, they know in their own experience with prophets, prophets come with miracles. They do miraculous things. And they have the da'wah of la ilaha illallah. That's what they call to. This man is doing miracles. He split the moon. Of course, but Allah split the moon. And these other things that are happening. And he's calling to the same thing their messengers called to, their prophets called to. So they know him. They know this is Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam. الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Those who um, خَسِرُوا They have lost themselves. Uh, they have lost any gain that they can gain from their selves and their actions. فَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ So they don't believe. Now, this could be, this last part of this verse could be understood in two ways. Um, one is because they behaved in ways that caused them to lose the good, lose their efforts, Right? They're behaving in that way. That type of behavior caused them to reject belief when the Prophet ﷺ came. That's one way of understanding. I think that's the more accurate way. The second way is that because they disbelieved, they began to behave in ways that harmed themselves. Does that make sense? Okay. So what we can take from this is that how we behave affects our iman. And how we believe affects our behavior. They're not separate. They go hand in hand. And so for those who say that just be a good person, that's it. Don't worry about the aqidah stuff. Don't worry about your prayers or rituals. Just be a good person. That's the most important thing. No doubt being a good person as we have gone through in Madaj al is fundamental to our faith. But if we don't have good faith, it's going to affect our manners. It is by default. And this is one of the major fallacies of kind of the, the spirit of our times, especially those who are more left-leaning, more liberal-leaning. Just be a good person, do good things for other people, and that's it. No, the way you believe is going to affect the way you engage other people. And I'll give you an example of that. How easy it is for couples to just leave them each other. That's it. Oh, you know, I'm going to go see my life. Peace out. They've been together for 10 years, and then oh, I just want to go and explore the hills of, of, of Europe. I I'm leaving you. Go bye-bye. Well, how, how, how much damage are you bringing to this young lady now? How much? Or the father or the mother who says, you know what, this whole fatherhood stuff, and I can't do with it. I'm leaving. I'll just be a good person to other people. No, you don't have the right to leave your children. And if that was part of my belief, then I wouldn't behave this way. So you cannot have good manners in a way that is actually positive, that a way that it's actually good for society, good for yourself, unless it is backed up with proper understanding. You cannot. Right? And so when, when our behaviors are centered around the ego, the self, I'm just going to do what is in my best interest, irrespective regardless of how it affects other people. How good of a person can you be? Yeah, you might do good things here, but you're doing it because it feeds the ego or it, it, it makes the, the self feel good. But what if it no longer makes itself feel good? What if you get bored of going and helping the orphans, for example? Are you just going to leave them? Just like one uh, young individual was kind of volunteering and doing things. Like, you know what? My, my heart isn't here and you know, therefore, you know, I'm just going to quit. I tell him, what are, you, what are you talking about, man? 
You think your heart is always going to be in what you do? The heart goes up and down. You think your, your father one day, you can say, oh, my heart isn't into, I don't feel like taking my child out today. Guess what? You still have to. You can't do it just because your heart is not into it. Right? Um, so that's one of kind of the, the challenges of our time today. وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنِ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا أَوْ كَذَّبَ بِآيَاتِهِ And who is more unjust than the one who fabricates a lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or rejects his signs, his miracles. Now, there are 11 verses in the Qur'an that begin with this, uh, with this question. Who is more unjust? And the way the, the way this, this question is structured adds another layer to the meaning. Who is more unjust? It's also a type of challenge. It's, ty it's also rhetorical. Meaning, I challenge you to find someone more unjust than this person. And that no one is more unjust than this person. This is what it is implying. And so there are 11 verses in the Quran that start with this uh, question. Who is more unjust than such and such? Eight of those 11 verses are precisely this. Who is more unjust than the one who fabricates a lie against Allah? Who is more unjust than that? And we've, we've gone over before why that is an act of injustice. There is nothing more beneficial, more important to a person's mental health, to a person's spiritual health, to a person's physical health, than understanding and knowing what Allah has said and having a healthy relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't tell us alcohol is forbidden just because. He didn't tell us pork is forbidden just because. He didn't encourage marriage just because. Right? There are reasons for it. And so our what is in our best interest goes back to this healthy relationship with Allah, a healthy understanding of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. As soon as we deviate from that, we have many problems occur. Look at the world today. Right? It's no it's nothing surprising or strange to the Muslims that when our generally speaking, the Iman and the the engage the religious engagement of Muslims is at a high that things are stable and good. Yet when they go down, things become chaotic. It's not strange to us. We understand why. Right? We understand the dynamics there. And so the ones who go about speaking wrong about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing the greatest injustice. Why? Because they are now harming people's relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most unjust. And so those who talk about Islam without knowledge, they are unjust people. Right? Like, you know, the, the challenges you all had to face, and I always mention this, when there was a, a huge void in terms of Islamic knowledge, and you had this misapplication of the religion, especially when it came to women in Islam, and how a wife is to be treated, or a daughter is to be treated, or how a mother treats the, in, the, the daughter-in-law and all that stuff. And they quote verses of the Quran and Hadith. The Prophet said this and the Quran says this. And all of it, as you come to know, all of that is, is inaccurate and pretty much lies about the application of, of these verses or these hadiths. Right? How much did it, how many people were harmed intensely because of that? How many people have left Islam, became secular, have became enemies of Islam as a result of that? Right? So misinformation about Islam creates monsters, right? It severs those relationships um, with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. So we really need to be careful of that. Now, what was Quraysh's lie against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We mentioned that they had a lot of reverence for Allah. But what was their lie against Allah? Um, their lie, there were many, but one of them was that there are others worthy worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is their greatest lie. Their lie that the Prophet ﷺ was not a messenger, rather he is a liar or a poet or a, a magician or a sorcerer and, and, and all these lies they, they attributed to him. Um, or the verse can be actually addressed to the people of the book because it comes right after. They are um, in their denial that the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger of Allah, the messenger that they've been waiting for. That is the greatest of injustices. And the Prophet ﷺ says that if 10 
10 people from among the Jews of Medina during his time were to have accepted Islam, all of Jews, all of Judaism, every single Jew would have accepted Islam. And the scholar said that those 10 people the Prophet was referring to were the 10 scholars that were in Medina at that time. If they would have accepted, then the follower, the, the, the layman of the Jewish tradition would have accepted as well. People follow their scholars. You know, I always get question, I heard the Mufti say this or this. We follow our scholars, right? And if our scholars are corrupt, the Ummah is going to be corrupt. But if the scholars are good, they're strong, they have deep knowledge, then that's going to disseminate through the Ummah. Right? And that's why the Prophet والسلام, compares scholars to stars. Like stars beautify the sky, scholars, actual real scholars, I mean people of knowledge and taqwa, right? Um, they beautify the Ummah. They spread the beauty throughout the Ummah. Yeah. Um, إِنَّهُ لَا Indeed, the unjust people will never be successful. وَيَوْمَ نَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا And on the day where we resurrect them all, we, we gather them all together. Now, how this verse connects to the previous one is um, either, and indeed, the unjust people will never be victorious, nor will they be victorious on the day when we gather everyone. That's one way of connecting the two verses. Um, Another way is seeing it that, um, that this verse 22 is not directly connected to verse 21 in terms of the, um, the sentence structure, but rather it's independent and we can understand it in a sense that, and on the day when we gather everyone, X and Y and Z is going to happen. We kind of fill in the blank because we know what, how Allah has described that day. Among, uh, there's one more opinion, but just for the sake of time, I won't go into that. Um, so we will gather them on that day and we will say to them, we will say to the ones who committed shirk, where are my partners? Where are these associates that you have uh, ascribed to me, that you have fabricated? Ladina kuntum tazumun. Zama in the Quran means you have lied about. You have claimed, but a claim that is a lie. Where are they? You love them in this life, you sacrificed for them, you waged war against my Prophet ﷺ because of them, out of love for them, thinking that they are going to assist you, you would go make dua to them, etc. Thinking that your strength, your power, your victory in this life, your success, your progress goes back to their, the barakah you get from them. Where are they today? Where? ثُمَّ لَمْ تَكُنْ فِتْنَتُهُمْ إِلَّا أَنْ قَالُوا وَاللَّهِ رَبِّنَا مَا كُنَّ مُشْرِكِينَ and then their fitna, their calamity on that day will be when they say, uh, Oh, our Lord, we were not uh, mushrikeen, we were not polytheists. What does this mean? Think about it. Imagine living a life around an idea that you sacrificed so much for, you lived so much for, you did everything for, only that when the time came for their help, it didn't do you anything. Imagine a best friend, for example, someone you thought was a best friend. You did for them so many favors, so many things. You helped them financially, you visited them when they were sick, you did this, this, this and that. And when you need them the most, they don't answer. They don't care. They don't come to help. How much regret would you feel? I did all of that for this person. What a waste. What an absolute waste. But this right here is even more. They're not saying I did all these things. They are rejecting the relationship in the first place. Why? Because now they know not only did, it not, did they not come to help me, they're actually the source of my misery. How much regret and humiliation on that day? The extent that they rejected the very things they lived for, they loved so much. What a shame. What an absolute shame. And so for us believers, what we can kind of benefit here is that when we want to do something, when we want to relate to something, when we want to build relationships, when we want to do whatever we do, the wise person is the one who before he or she acts, they think about the end result. 
That is a wise person. If I do this, what is the end result? For example, a young man and a young woman want to have a relationship. They want to enjoy themselves. Think about it for a moment. For how long are you going to enjoy yourself? A few moments, an hour or two? But how much regret might that cause? A lifetime. Is it worth it? Absolutely not. And you add on top of that the negative consequences in the afterlife, the third greatest sin. The third greatest sin. I do not know of a young man and woman or a Muslim, a Muslim who committed this uh, sin and did, not re uh, and did not repent, like a huge repentance, except that they really paid the price for it for many, many years. And it's one of the greatest sins. All for what? For a little bit of fun. So a wise person thinks of the consequence. Now, to broaden this a little bit, what happens when we do even some of the simplest things? Right. I wanna, should I be friends with this person? Right, should I be friends with this person? Well, for us Muslims, we have a huge advantage. If we ask the question, how can this friendship benefit me in the afterlife? Will you ever regret that? You had a friendship, right? You went and you visited this person when they were ill. You helped them financially, but you did all of that for the sake of Allah. On the day of judgment, will you regret it? Even though, even if that person ends up turning their back on you sometime in your life. But I, they were a huge means for me to do a lot of good deeds. Nothing to regret, right? Go on with your life. I'll find Allah will provide me with someone else. And so, one of the wisdoms of this verse is look at the consequence of their beliefs in the afterlife. It was so negative. Not only was it a source of major regret, they denied it entirely. For us believers, when we transform our engagements, whether social, political, spiritual, etc., we do it for the sake of Allah, seeking the reward of Allah in, in accordance to Quran and Hadith. We will ever regret it? Will we ever deny it? Absolutely not. And to kind of give a, a beautiful example of that, on the Day of Judgment, the believer will stand in front of Allah. The believer will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will say, you have some sins that I, I hid from the people in this life. And today I'm going to hide it from them in the afterlife. So he puts a veil between them two and everyone else. So it's just a one-on-one -on -one private conversation no one else hears. And Allah will say, you remember that sin? The believer will say, yes. The believer doesn't deny, yes. You remember that sin? You remember that sin? You remember that sin? Yes, yes, yes. Now the person, Allah is counting my sins. That will, I'm done. But this is a believer who Allah loves. And Allah will say, I hid them from other people in, the, in, in your life. I protected you from the negative consequences of them in your life. Today, I will do the same and I will make them into good deeds for you, All right? For the believer. What does the believer then say? So, oh Allah, I have other sins you don't talk about. I have this sin, that sin, that sin, that sin, that sin, right? All right? Out of hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because this is a moment where everything is on the line. And so that is, just think about that moment, how heartwarming that is. How optimistic that is. But that is the result of what? Having that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and wanting the afterlife. The more we center our lives and our behaviors around their implications in the afterlife, the more heartwarming the afterlife will be for us and those moments in the afterlife. But the more we disconnect ourselves from that, the closer we become to what these polytheists are doing on the Day of Judgment. Their calamity was what? They denied all that they did in life. They had nothing. Absolutely nothing. Look at how they lied about themselves and what they did. Look at how they lied. For the believer, in this hadith I just quoted, you did this sin, the believer doesn't lie. I mean, what, I'm going to lie to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Look at how their truthfulness led to good deeds and opened doors for other good deeds. Oh Allah, you, there's these other sins. I'd like to talk about them. Okay? Whereas these individuals, their entire life, now they are rejecting it. What a shame. And what they used to fabricate has left them. No good in what they all did. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. We will stop there.